I have the pleasure of serving as Dean of the Frank G. Zarb School of Business. We are truly delighted to have with us today two experts in cybersecurity, we, who also happen to be an alum and one of our very own professors in the Zarb School. And both of them are going to try to help us better understand the cyber threats, which affect not only our businesses, but us as individuals as well. You know, at Zarb, in partnership with the School of Engineering, we recently opened the Cybersecurity Innovation and Research Center. It's truly a state-of-the-art facility used to train students to detect and defend against cybersecurity, against cybercrime, as well as provides training opportunities for the community at large. It allows for an immersive virtual experience and is one of the main academic, or actually one of the only rather academic war rooms um, in the New York area. And we use this facility extensively for our students who are studying cybersecurity, whether they're in information systems and business analytics, or perhaps minoring in our information security and management minor, or in our graduate program in cybersecurity. And, and any of our students who have an interest in learning more have access to this great facility. And I know today's discussion will be of great interest to all of us. But before we begin, let me just take a moment to quickly introduce our two experts. Alan Brewer has spent the last 42 years holding various roles in technology with the financial services sector. For the past 13 years, Mr. Brewer has been working at Flushing Bank and currently has the position of Senior Executive Vice President and Chief Information Officer. During his career, Mr. Brewer, a graduate of the ZARB MBA program, has held senior technology roles within Citibank, JP Morgan Chase, AIG, and a global technology consulting company. In the late 90s, Mr. Brewer spent two years in the former Soviet Union installing ATM cash machines for a number of Russian banks deploying smart card technology, the precursor to the chip technology being used by all major credit card companies today. Dr. Alexander Pelez is an Associate Professor of Information Systems and Business Analytics at the Zarb School and is a former Teacher of the Year recipient. Dr. Pelez has two decades of management leadership and strategic experience, holding various senior level technology positions with a variety of companies, both large and small. His research interests include healthcare, information technology, social media, big data, strategy, online consumer behavior, and e-commerce. He received a PhD from Peru College at the, university, at the City University of New York, an MBA from the Zarb School, and a Master of Science in Computer Science from NYU. So please join me in welcoming our experts, Alan Brewer and Alex Pelez. So uh, I'm Alex Pelez. Again, I'm an Associate Professor in the Information Systems and Business Analytics Department, where uh, Soviet security is uh, embedded in. Uh, we're going to talk a few different things uh, regarding uh, cybersecurity. And what I'm going to be speaking about is really from a personal level, protecting your data, what hackers go after, what people are trying to do, and how they can leverage that. Uh, so that's going to be the focus of uh, uh, my particular portion of this talk. We'll talk about you know social media, email, mobile devices, and so forth. So if we can go to the next slide. So what is this whole notion of personal security? Uh, we are more tied to devices than we've ever been before. Uh, we do a lot of transactions on our mobile devices. We have a number of apps. We are highly connected to social media through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and every other type of uh, social media platform that's currently available. Uh, and it's not, so cybersecurity isn't just about hacking computers, it's about attacking personal information because that information could be used for identity theft, they can steal credit. Uh, your name could be uh, spread in a, in a misleading way or in a way that you don't want. We have issues of personal revenge that occur and even cyberbullying, which is another big problem within uh, high school and college uh, age folks. And basically with cybersecurity, we need to focus on what we're posting, what we're putting out there on every social media platform. And you'd be surprised at the amount of information that can be actually extracted from a simple post that you think is very benign. Our emails are under constant information that we provide, as well as 
people trying to get a customer to click on a link to actually install something on a computer. And our mobile apps are more increasingly at risk uh, because of the information that we are downloading and everything else that, uh, that is available on our phones. So we'll go to the next slide. So let's talk about a couple of key incidents that have occurred. We, we have uh, WhatsApp, which is in the news uh, more recently. In September, there were a number of vulnerabilities that were uncovered by some uh, groups. Uh, WhatsApp has not confirmed these. But one of the things that, what, uh, that the vulnerabilities allowed, they allowed malicious hackers to intercept and send messages. So this is a form of an intrusion where you believe you're having a message uh, conversation with somebody, but someone is in the middle basically extracting that and collecting that information or even sending you bad information. Think about a transaction that you have or a conversation that you might have with someone at a bank, right? Where you think you're talking to someone at a bank and what you're doing is you're actually talking to a hacker in between who's now collecting a whole bunch of private information from you. Please give me your, uh, let me have your social security number or what's your bank account number? I'll try and help you with that as an example. In October of 2020, foreign entities used browsers to gain access to Facebook accounts. So they would literally take over a number of accounts and they could examine the payment profiles that were occurring, which was a $4 million scheme uh, based on some of those accounts. We could find people who were shopping uh, using the Facebook uh, shopping area marketplace, I think it's called, as well as people post information, I just bought XYZ on PayPal. There's so much good information that you can collect off of Facebook, like a person's birthday or you know where they live or where they travel to or even relatives, all the information that could be used to actually go to a bank and say, I am this person. I keep using the bank because Alan's gonna follow me here with uh, uh, all the, uh, the stuff that uh, he's about to get nervous with that, that people are exposing the bank to. Um, also in 2018, there was a hack that took 50 million uh, users information. So they were able to extract all of this personal information, store it, and it's out somewhere on the net, which basically makes those folks very vulnerable. And in 2020, I believe it was in April, hackers took over personal accounts. So they would actually pretend to be someone that they weren't. And this one was in the news quite a bit. So we'll go to the next slide. From an email perspective, we have things like phishing attacks where a malicious email will come in and it's an attempt to gain personal information. So they'll say, you know, there's a problem with your account. Please click on this link so you can, uh, you know, fix it. And it sends you to a site in which you, it asks you for some personal information, maybe a bank account number, maybe uh, some, uh, your social security number, whatever it is. But it looks like a real site. It actually lures the reader who's not paying attention into clicking something that will either install an item on their uh, computer or take them to one of these malicious sites to collect that information. And in many cases, it even tries to get you to forward a message. If, especially if it's trying to install something, it will say, you know, send this to 15 of your friends for good luck today and click on the link for, uh, you know, to, to uh, get favor with money and so forth. So these types of attacks are very popular because so many readers fail to validate the sender. They don't look at who is actually sending the email. I know I have seen this a couple of times and I inadvertently, I see the name and uh, Dean Lennon was actually one of the people and I accidentally clicked on it because I thought it was from her and I didn't even validate it and I stopped it in between. But everyone is susceptible if we don't take the time to validate who the sender is. Uh, we have a number of click attacks which will attempt to install extensions in Chrome or software on the computer. One of the most common ones is crypto coin miners. Uh, you'll see where you're, you actually will click or something gets put onto your computer where you don't realize it. And then in the background, it starts running. It's, you can literally hear like in uh, my computer once it happened where it will actually be running and the fan is going and the CPU is going. You're like, why is my computer slowing down? And it's because there's a software that was put onto the computer that's literally trying to mine for Bitcoin or mine for uh, Ethereum or one of the other crypto coin miners. And they can it literally attack the browser uh, from an email perspective or even some of the email clients that exist out there. We can move to the next slide. 
Our mobile apps are becoming an increasing target because of how much information is out there. We do a lot of financial and operational transactions. We have our retirement applications. We do banking online. We have social media in the same uh, device. We're buying from Amazon or from Target or from other stores. Mobile commerce is about $250 billion. That number was before uh, COVID. So my guess is, is that that number probably went a lot higher do, uh, during the COVID crisis. Um, about 70% of fraud transactions came from mobile apps and mobile browsers in 2018. So that number probably stays pretty steady. It means that this device, this mobile device that we have is the target for folks because if I doing more transactions and I'm doing them quicker, I can get you to do things because it seems to be more secure when it may not be. About 50% of malicious mobile apps were in these tools and lifestyle categories. What does that mean? Well, I want this nice little uh, tool to show me how to do yoga or meditation. Seems like a very benign application, but it may actually be a malicious application that's actually collecting personal data. Another thing that these types of attacks do, they try and gain your payment information or they try and get you to pay for something that you didn't want. So you don't realize that you download it and then there's a subscription that you have to pay $30 a month for it for something that you thought was free or that you don't want. But a lot of times it is about gaining that information because so much information is on here and many users are not really attuned to the amount of attacks that actually occur on the mobile applications. So this is a very increasingly researched area. We move to the next slide. Oops, duplicate. Go to the next one. So how, let's just take an example of some social media posts that could cause a problem. So let's say that you are in an office and you basically take a picture of a team event or a gathering and you post that online. So what's interesting is that a malicious actor can send you an email about it and you might not suspect it. I see a picture, an office party of, you know, the softball team or so forth, and I send an email to that person. Why? Because that post is public. I see that picture. I know where they're playing. Hey, that was a great game at Kenny Ag Park. Uh, what did you think about it? Hey, I got this video that you can see. Click the link. Person doesn't think of where it's coming from, and they literally click on the link because, hey, how did this person know that we just played softball and we were at a particular place? Another one which is interesting, and I've heard about this a couple of times, a new proud employee takes a picture of their new badge at their new company and then posts it on LinkedIn. Hi, this is my first day. And Al's smiling like, I'm going to take these off of LinkedIn right now. The image itself that is posted is a high-res image, and it could be used to create fake badges. You, a, a malicious actor doesn't care. They'll take out and crop the image. They now know what the badge looks like, and they will try and create a fake badge so that they can gain entry. People won't know the difference. Um, video blogs, Instagram, TikTok posts. I'm on the TikTok. No, I'm actually not. I'm just kidding. Um, barely use it. My kids do. Uh, but you do a post from your apartment or complex or a house, and it can reveal where you live. I now can probably get your address. Some of the posts in some, um, I, uh, some social media platforms, and I just found out that Parler, even though it was just taken down, someone basically was able to harvest all of the photos Parler actually never took off the geo identification on any of those photos. So if you got any Parler photo, you know exactly where that photo was taken and you can basically geolocate any position from that uh, particular account. So you could be revealing also the layout of your space based on the post. Uh, if I'm basically showing my kitchen and I'm showing the doors, I'm actually telling people, this is how you can get into my house. Or I have this great painting that seems to be you know, fairly valuable. You may not think it's valuable, um, someone else does, and they can break in or do anything with that information. Birthday Instagram and Facebook posts, love this. They'll reveal your private information. Hey, it's our 40th birthday. Maybe you didn't post your birthday, but someone posted the picture of the birthday event. Now a hacker knows your birth date, and that's one of the key things that they can use for identity theft. So much information can be gleaned inadvertently from a particular picture, post, or video. And so it's really important to understand that when you're making these posts, that you have a good idea of what is actually going out there. Many of these that I've listed here are fairly benign. You wouldn't think twice about, you know, hey, I'm a new employee. 
But as you can see Al's reaction, this is like, uh-oh, I'm now, I'm now scared of this one because this is a nightmare for CIOs, that particular one. Um, and the other pieces are just private information that could be used against you. Then the next slide. So how can we protect our information? There's really like a passive and active and yin yang approach. Um, we can take a defensive approach by preserving information. Don't post things out there. If you're on Facebook, make sure that you verify your contact requests. Someone says, hey, I'm this person, you know, I just lost my account and you click confirm. Now that person has access to everything that you have. Uh, and that may not have been the right person. Maybe you don't need to be friends with 5,000 people. Uh, that may be another issue. You can turn on two-factor authentication to make sure that no one can access your account unless you have a two-factor authentication mode, which means that when I log into Facebook or whatever it is, it'll send me a note on my phone saying, are you really who you say you are? Limit stored payment information. Try not to keep everything posted. Uh, so you, you, if you have like every single credit card on your phone, that could be an issue. Maybe consider having one credit card that you use for mobile transactions and only that credit card is on your phone. Um, and finally, review your apps usage, both on your mobile phone as well as let's say in Facebook where you have the apps. Review what you're using and anything that you're not using, turn it off or remove and don't keep those accounts active. From an offensive perspective, search your own information. Go on to Google, look for those, uh, look for queries that may have your name or your address and find out what people know about you. That is a very offensive and active approach to see what is out there. And there are some services that allow you to do that. That again goes to credit score as well, trying to find out what's going on. Change your passwords regularly and have strong passwords. Uh, let's not you know, keep our password the same for the last past three years and having your password as password one, password two pretty much doesn't work. I'm sure that's another thing that Al keeps Al up at night with the uh, insecure passwords of uh, some folks. Uh, remove unused connections. If you've got people who are not connected to you, just get rid of them. Um, you're not being insulting by removing them as a friend or you're not uh, being uh, rude. It's just, if you don't have much to say with them, then remove them. Limit installing social media apps. Uh, again, you don't need every social media app, only keep what you are constantly using and then remove any unwanted applications from your uh, phone. Uh, we have, you know, I, I, I periodically go through cleaning on my phone because I've downloaded even some games. You just get rid of the games. You just don't need them anymore. You play a game for a few weeks, get rid of it after a while. There's no reason to keep it on your phone. And finally, inform your friends, right? Talk to your friends when they post something that they shouldn't or say, hey, could you take that down because that's got some personal information. I think nine times or you know, 95 times out of 100, nine times out of 10, and they'll be more than willing to get rid of that information. Uh, but it's also a way to teach your friends about cybersecurity and private information and keeping it private where you believe it should be. So go to the next slide. So, and, and that concludes the part of the privacy uh, of your uh, personal privacy on social media. So I'll turn it over to Al. Can you hear me? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. First, I'd, uh, and thanks, Alex, uh, for setting the stage that uh, feeds right into what I want to talk about. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Janet and Ariella for giving me the opportunity to talk with all of you this afternoon. Um, I think a, a good place to start would be just to give a, a, a quick uh, definition of what cyber, uh, uh, what a cyber attack is. And it's a deliberate attempt to exploit a vulnerability in a system, a device, or a network to manipulate, steal, or gain on unauthorized access. Um, so what, with that in mind, so what are, what are the corporate entities? What's the landscape that they're facing today? Well, you know, one of the most valuable, besides their employees, one of the most valuable assets a company has is its data. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the criminals understand that too. So that puts a pretty big target on the back of most, on the back of most companies. Um, a study in 2018 found that the average cost of a data breach globally was $3.9 million. Now, that's globally, I think, in the United States, a little bit higher than that. Um, but that same study also found that the average cost of a lost piece of data or data record was about $150 uh, for each record. That doesn't seem like a lot, but I'll talk a little bit later on in the presentation about what makes up that $150 and what the real impact of that is to an organization. 
uh, one thing that's it's important to understand is a, is a breach can happen in a blink of an eye. I mean, it's as, it's as simple as a mouse click or hitting the return key on your keyboard. Um, and the truth of the matter is you could have done one of those things and, and allowed malicious software to be applied to your desktop or your laptop or your iPad or your iPhone and not even realize it for months. Um, and most breaches that happen in the corporate world sit there undetected for months, if not a years, as slowly ciphering off data uh, for the bad actors to, to reuse and resell. Um, I, and 90% and of the 90 plus percent of successful data breaches occur in less than, less than a minute. 60% of those breaches are aimed at small businesses. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, cartoon that used to, used to exist where there is these two hunters being chased through the woods by a bear. And the first hunter turns to the second hunter and he says, I don't think we're gonna be able to outrun this bear. The second hunter turns back to the first hunter and he says, I don't have to outrun the bear, I have to outrun you. So it's kind of the same thing with security. You're never gonna bulletproof. It's impossible to bulletproof your organization. But what helps is if you're harder to breach than the guy across the street. Because if you're harder to breach than the guy across the street, they're gonna go after the guy across the street because cyber criminals wanna go for the path of least resistance. Uh, I think we can uh, change slides, please. So now I'll give you, I'll, I'll share a few statistics about some uh, data breaches in the past couple of years. 94% of malware, which is delivered through an email, and I think Alex kind of touched on that uh, when he was talking earlier. 34% of data breaches occur, uh, which is due to insiders. I mean, somebody inside the company had something to do with that breach. 22% um, of data breaches include social attacks, and you know, Alex talked a little bit about that as well. 17% of data breaches involve malware, mis, uh, malicious software, and 8% of data breaches are due to the misuse of authorized users, meaning there's somebody who was authorized to use the data in your company, but used it in such a way that caused, that created risk for your company and exposed the company. Um, also, 80% of security breaches were a result of phishing attacks, and 60% of security breaches occurred due to unpatched vulnerabilities, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well further on. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, now that we've touched on the landscape, um, let's talk about the frequency of these, these breaches. The University of Maryland research found a cyber attack occurs every 39 seconds or just under 20, 22, just over 2,200 attacks per day. Veronis, which is a, which is a software, a cybersecurity software uh, vendor, found that seven, 7 million data records were lost or stolen every single day, and 56 data records are compromised every second. That's, that's uh, quite significant. That's, 40, that's 56 data records in a, in a second. So that's been pretty much one a minute. That's all day. That, that's approximately 2.5 billion data records compromised annually. So now if you go back to my original, the other screen, not that you need to go back, um, where I talked about $150 per record. If you times that by the, the 2.5 billion, you're talking about somewhere around $380 million, $80 billion of expense to organizations, to corporations as a result of data breaches. And even if the University of Maryland was half right, you're still talking about $195 billion. And even if they were a quarter of the percent, 25%, right, you're still talking about $95 billion. That's a significant amount of money. Um, and we talk in, in, the, in the billions here, and that number is only growing each year. Um, so to give you some, some idea of what that means, uh, what a billion actually means, if from the day you were born, you started counting from one, you would most likely die of old age before you reached the billion. Now, I, I know most of you are listening to that and say that's, that's impossible. And you'll probably Google, a lot of you are probably sitting there with your phones right now Googling that. But I can tell you that's a fact. That's how large that is. I mean, we're so used to hearing these kind of numbers. We don't, we don't really put it in context. But when you're talking about $300 billion worth of lost ex or added expenses to corporations, that's a, that's a significant amount of money. Um, next slide, please. So what are the uh, four most common 
uh, types of attacks. And, and Alex touched on a few of these. Obviously, it's uh, social related, which are phishing, spare phishing, phishing, which happens to do with the same kind of thing, only using a phone, uh, tailgating where somebody uses a fake ID or compromise that he to walk in behind you on, at, at the door. Um, malware, which uh, is malicious software that gets installed on, on a device. Um, denial of service account attacks, and then web application attacks. Next, next slide, please. Uh, so phishing. Um, well, Alex talked a little bit about this, so I'm not going to I'm not going to go into a great deal about it. I'll just tell you about a, how it relates, how the same thing that could happen to you personally uh, happens to organizations. FACC, which is an aerospace maker, lost about sixty one million dollars because a fraudster, a bad actor, a malicious person sent an email faking out as the as the CEO of the company asking for funds, sixty one million dollars to be transferred to a project that didn't exist. And then, and then the bad actor walked away with 60, $61 million of the company's, company's money. And that's because, as Alex said, they don't want to ask. They take for granted that if it came from the CEO, it must be legitimate, even though it was, it was a spoofed email. Um, next slide, please. Malware. Um, malware is kind of a, a catch-all term for any type of malicious software designed to harm or exploit uh, programmable devices or networks. Typically, that kind of, of software is done to gain, for financial gain. Um, ransomware, which is a, um, a type of, one of the types of these attacks, um, is where they encrypt files and then, and then ask you to pay in, in cyber currency to get your, to get your keys to un unencrypt. So I'm sorry, I'm, I guess I, I jumped ahead. I didn't talk about the University of California, which, uh, which actually fell a victim to one of these for 1.4 million. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of slowed down in 2019. These attacks kind of subsided a bit, but in 2020, and maybe it's because of all of the remote from home and the, and the challenges of organizations having to extend their infrastructure out to people at their homes, that this, there was a big uptick in this kind of uh, attack in 2020. Uh, next slide, please. DDoS, distributed denial of service attack. Uh, so this is this is where where attackers try to flood a, a website or a um, an organization with so much traffic that the systems that they have can't handle it, and as a result, that system crashes. Um, believe it or not, you could go today out to the dark web and purchase, and not even purchase, but actually get for free, the ability to use hijacked equipment to, a, to facilitate an attack. So if I today wanted to, to attack, uh, I don't know, Netflix, right? I could go out on the dark web and go, and go set it up so that I could get hundreds of thousands of devices, what, what they call robots, these bots, to it at a specific moment, flood a, a, a point of, a, of entry for Netflix with, with just constant traffic to the point where Netflix can't handle the amount of traffic and they crash. One of the largest one of the largest one of these or most notable one um, was in October of 2016, which took down the whole internet for most of US and, and Europe and, uh, and Twitter, Netflix and CNN and all those were, were off the air. They typically don't use denial of service attacks uh, for financial gain, it's more malicious type of attack. However, there are times when it's used. And in fact, our bank itself was a victim of a, a DDoS attack a few years ago uh, with a ransom request. Um, we got the request like now, two, three o'clock in the afternoon from a Russian uh, hacking organization telling us they were going to attack our website if we didn't pay them X amount of cyber uh, bitcoins. Of course, we refused to pay. And sure enough, about 15 minutes later, the attack took place. Um, it, did knock our, it did knock our website off the air because we couldn't handle the, the amount of traffic. But our, on, <clears throat> excuse me, our online banking system, uh, we, we just put up a default page that said we were down doing maintenance and gave another link to get to the online banking. So the only thing that impacted us as a result 
was we lost our marketing pages for a couple hours, um, but our customers didn't lose the ability to do any transactions online. We were lucky because we had that fallback, but a lot of companies, when they suffer this thing, they're, they're off the air. Um, next slide, please. Ah, web application attacks. So these are the, these are the kind of attacks that are that are due mainly to unpatched software. Uh, uh, hackers, excuse me, one second. They take advantage of weaknesses or vulnerabilities uh, to gain access to to data. Um, believe it or not, you run about somewhere between twenty and thirty thousand vulnerabilities discovered every year. So what that means is there's software that gets written, gets installed, updated throughout the year in corporations. And every time that happens, there's a chance that another vulnerability has been introduced into your environment. And the companies that write the software, they identify those vulnerabilities eventually, and then they send you patches to go to go patch those vulnerabilities, which, which you're supposed to do on a, on a, on a regular basis. Um, not every vulnerability can be um, used. In other words, not every vulnerability has software written against it that allows the hacker to take advantage of that vulnerability. So, so you do have some amount of time where in between the time the vulnerability is identified and the time you have to, you have to close that window. But, but it happens at such a rate that the company spend a great deal of their resources doing nothing but patching software all day. Now, one of the other types of malicious uh, attacks that happened recently, I don't know if you're aware of this, but a company called SolarWinds recently was, was hacked um, in a different kind of a way, what they call a um, supply chain hack. So co sometimes companies, when they're writing software packages to be, to be sold, they, they farm out that development to multiple different companies to do that development for them. And that's considered their supply chain. And they can do that to foreign countries, to, to different companies throughout around the United States or whatever. And then they, they pull all that software back, they, they put it together, and that's the package they sell. Well, SolarWinds, which, which is a company that sells, believe it or not, cybersecurity software, was breached. And it was breached because as part of their development process, some malicious software was added to their environment. And then they went ahead and, and sent that software out to 18,000 companies that we know of right now, that number is continuing every day to grow. And some rather large companies like our home, Homeland Security or uh, Department of Commerce, uh, Microsoft, Intel, Cisco, all of those companies were ended up breached because of, of this uh, SolarWinds problem. So that's how quickly it happens. That's how undetected it happens. That's, so now that because this whole supply chain issue got elevated, now it's, it's on corporations now added this whole other level of scrutiny that have, we have to go through to protect ourselves against this type of, of attack, meaning that now when we purchase software, we have to do our due diligence to make sure that even their third parties or so fourth parties uh, didn't it's inject any uh, bad software in those packages. It's a whole different level of compromise. Okay, another next one, please. So what's the impact come up to companies when these breaches happen? Well, remember earlier, I, I talked about the $150 for per stolen record. Well, these are the five things that, that come to making up that, that $150. Um, no surprises here. Anytime you get uh, a, a breach, you're gonna have some type of uh, operational disruption. Operational disruptions mean parts, parts of your company are gonna shut down, parts of things are not gonna work, impacts your revenue. Uh, cost. You have a reputation exposure. If you you expose customers' personal information, they're going to lose trust in your ability to keep the, that information safe. So they're going to go find someone else that supplies the same type of products you do, uh, and you're going to lose that revenue. Legal expenses are um, can be phenomenal. And if you happen to be uh, a, a regulated company like a bank, there's always a chance that the FDIC or one of those regulators will come in and, and stop you from, from, from doing business and find you significant sums of money if they find out that the breach was a result of something that you didn't do right. And they can hold, believe it or not, they can hold today, can hold board of director members 
personally responsible if they find out that the board of directors were aware of a deficiency and chose not to have it corrected. As you know, most organizations have to go to their board for money to, to, to spend on things like cybersecurity. Um, so if, if a chief information security officer in a bank were to happen to go to the board and say, hey, we have this potential risk here, and I think we need to do this. And then the next day that risk got exploited because the board chose not to address it. They stand to, to be held accountable personally uh, for some of that loss. I'm sorry, uh, next, uh, next slide, please. So, so we talked about all of this stuff. So uh, the risk, the uh, cybersecurity and all that. So let's talk about the people who help protect organizations for these threats. Cybersecurity specialists are responsible for their organization's computer related security. They ensure that the data remains secure and protected against cyber attacks. Uh, they play a crucial, crucial role in a company's overall well being. And they are in big demand and they get paid a pretty big salary for someone who's good at their job. So uh, this is right now quite the, uh, quite the career path for a lot of people to be following. Um, a successful, good chief information security officers get paid a lot of money, uh, equivalent to most of the C-suite executives, meaning the chief operating officers, the, the CIOs, the CEOs, all of those. Um, and they're hard to come by. Good good uh, cybersecurity specialists are hard to come by. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk about some of the, the traits that make up a good uh, cybersecurity specialist. Uh, low key, what we mean here is you, you have to be a modest type of person, not somebody who's looking to be in the limelight all the time. Altruistic, you really need to have a desire to, to, to help people because basically that's the role you fulfill in your organization. You have to be able to be cool under fire and you need to be able to keep your composure. Yeah, so you need to be scientific in, in your thinking and desire to solve problems using data and analytic skills, inquisitive, you know, that need to know desire, um, skeptical, like that trust no one type of attitude, responsive, you need to be able to react quickly and, and in a positive way. And you have to be diligent. You need to be uh, oriented towards finishing and pushing things to completion. Uh, next slide. So cyber attacks are becoming more frequent and more harmful every day. All right? The Bureau of Labor Statistics predicts that uh, job growth for cyber security individuals will grow at 31% to, through 2029. That's seven times faster than the national average job growth. So Again, there's a big opportunity for people in this field uh, and a big demand. <clears throat> so one of the questions I, I, I get often is, uh, you know, if I wanted to get started in here, are there really, are there really entry level jobs in this, in this area? And um, two of the, uh, there, there are basically two, two approaches to this. One is you never get started in security. You go, you go to some other technology discipline and then you eventually move into security. And the other is you know, don't waste your time doing something else. If the security is what you do, then just go find a job in security. Um, <clears throat> personally, I, I, don't, I don't care one way or the other. There's no, no, neither one of those means anything more to me than the other. Um, what I will tell you from a personal experience is in, in past years, most of the people that have come in front of me for a job in information security did come from other areas of IT uh, disciplines. Now, I think I've seen, I, not I think, I know I've seen a change in that in recent years in that discipline. And I think it's due mainly because of, of universities like Hofstra that are now offering programs for, for cybersecurity. And so now you, they are preparing young people or, or entry level people for the skill with the skills that they need to jump into the to security at, at that level. Um, earlier, I talked about the, the traits to be successful in the in the cybersecurity, you don't really need to have all of those traits. Cybersecurity crosses a broad spectrum of activities. Um, so if you if you if you rather do analytic type work, 
than, than governing type work, uh, then there's a certain number of those skills that play more towards the analytics. If, uh, if you rather uh, defend and protect versus analytics, then you have those other skills. I guess the, the, what I'm saying is it's a broad, the skills required to become a, a successful security expert um, is wide range, but you do have to have this inherent sense of this is something you want to do to be good at it. And when you're good at it, it'll be rewarding for you.